Ooh, we're scupping, I think. You don't want to check your lens after this. So scup can pretty much be found anywhere from south of Cape Cod all the way down to the Middle Atlantic. Um, they tend to prefer a sandy bottom. Right now we're fishing in an estuary actually. Most times you find them out in the open beach, but I've been hitting them here when I've been fishing for fluke. Um, and a very prolific fish. I think you can keep 30 a day, which I would never even come close to keeping that many because they're kind of a pain to fillet. Um, but a nice good eating fish when you get them fresh. They're perfect for cooking whole because they're small, which is how we're gonna prepare these today. Right now it's late June. We're here on Cape Cod. These fish usually roll in around the second week of May and they'll be here through October. And really, you can catch them anytime. There's no particular time that is better than another. They're feeding all during the day. So you get a late morning like we have here. The stripers are pretty much napped out by this time. Um, but the scupper are always feeding. So it's a good daytime way to get some fresh fillets. Nope, oh, there's one. Come on, eat it, eat it. Don't listen to your buddy in the bucket. A lot of weed in the water this morning. You wanna make sure you keep any weed off your bait. That's pretty important with all kinds of bottom fishing. Oh, here we go. That's a scupper. Tap, 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 tap. Eat it. Oh, I get him. Oh, I got him. Ooh. This is a feisty one. Really make a lot of head shakes, you know, right away when you get a scup. So just tapping all over the place. Oh, pulling a little drag on me, are you? I'm gonna teach you. That looks like a keeper. They actually do have some really pretty colors to them. You get that kind of electric blue, that deep purple on them. Cool looking little fish. I like to bleed all my fish. Not only does it make the fillets better, but it's really the ethical thing to do. I do a lot of hunting in the hunting world. Everybody's real keen on making the kill as quick as possible, but you don't see that in the fishing world. A lot of people will just throw them in the cooler, let them die slow. And when that happens, they actually release a lot of lactic acid, which can make their meat deteriorate quicker. So the quicker the kill, the better your meal. The other kind of fun thing about fishing little pieces of bait on little hooks is you never really know what you're gonna catch. Um, it's pretty early in the season now, it's late June, but come later in the summer, late August, September, you get a lot of weird things move in here. You get puffer fish, um, you get little jacks that you catch occasionally, you get sea robins, you get fluke out of here. So it's always entertaining when you catch something different. Here we go. Eat it, eat it, eat it. Oh, I got him. It's live action. Number three, it's a trophy by no means. Scuff will get quite a bit bigger than this. Though, you know, a real big one is two and a half, three pounds would be considered a monster. These little guys are perfect for a lunchtime snack. Now we're scupping.
Ooh. Oh, hit like a freight train. Oh, he's digging in. All right, there's number four. We are ready for lunchtime. Pretty much everybody has heard about General Tso's chicken. It's actually the number one selling dish in Chinese restaurants in America. Uh, and for good reason, it's, it's a great sauce, um, fried chicken, who doesn't like that? But you never hear General Tso's pork, you never hear General Tso's beef. Most people have never heard of General Tso's fish, but that's what we're gonna be whipping up today. Um, like I said, the sauce is amazing, and we have some scup that we caught this morning. We're gonna prepare those whole with a General Tso's sauce. And the whole history of General Tso's chicken is pretty fascinating. A couple of years ago, I watched a documentary. It's called The Search for General Tso. And the producers printed out a photograph of a pile of General Tso's chicken. And they went to China, the Hunan province of China. And they walked around the streets and showed people this picture of General Tso's chicken and nobody knew what it was. There is no General Tso's chicken in China. Um, one lady looked at it and her comment was, that doesn't look like chicken, that looks like frog. And so they then went into the history of General Tso and there was indeed a General Tso and he was a pretty mighty warrior. This is back in the late 1800s in China, in the Hunan province. To this day, he's still kind of relegated as a hero in the area. There's a museum for him. There is a General Tso's Square. There's a General Tso's Liquor. But there certainly isn't any General Tso's Chicken. Um, it was 1949. China... Albie, no. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> Dog needs lovin's. So in 1949, China became communist after World War II, and there was a chef there that worked for the government, a real high-end chef. His name was Peng Chang Kao, and he fled the country. He went to Taiwan to get away from the Communist Party, and he started a restaurant there, and it became a smashing success. It was actually internationally known. He came from the city of Hunan, where the actual General Cao came from, and he decided to name one of his chicken dishes at his restaurant, General Tso's Chicken, in honor of the legendary warrior. Um, and it became very popular, but his version was very much unlike what Americans associate with General Tso's Chicken. He had the chicken hole on the bone, it wasn't deep fried. The sauce had a lot of vinegar, it was extremely spicy, it wasn't sweet. Um, but then it was around 1973, this is when Chinese food was really becoming popular in America. There was a chef in New York City. His name was Sung Ting Wang, I believe. I got that correct. And he had opened up a very popular Chinese restaurant in New York City. It was, it was, you know, business was booming. And he decided to go to Taiwan to try to find some different dishes to bring back and work into his menu. So he tried the General Tso's chicken and said, oh, this is great. I think I can modify this that in a way that Americans will like it. Um, in you know, early 70s, this is when Kentucky Fried Chicken is really getting going, so he decides he's gonna deep fry and bread the chicken. Um, and he decides, you know, Americans like sweet food, so he's added a lot of sugar to the recipe. And I believe he was also the one that added MSG to it, which anybody that knows me knows I'm a big fan of MSG. It makes pretty much anything taste better. And so he came up with his version of General Tso's chicken and it instantly became the number one seller. People loved it and the rest they say is history. So the first couple times I made General Tso's fish, I made it very much like General Tso's chicken where I took nuggets of fish, I breaded them, I deep fried them, made the sauce, put it over with the broccoli and all that. Um, but I've also done it a few times since with whole fish and today we're working with scup they can be pretty bony. They're not the easiest fish to fillet. Uh, the fillets you do get are pretty small, so anytime I'm cooking scup, I like to keep them whole. So that's how we're gonna be preparing these fish today. So the first step is, we need to remove the fins. So these things are like little cactuses. These, 
spines on the dorsal fin are like super sharp needles. So we're going to take a pair of shears and we're going to trim those off. And one of the main reasons I do that is because when I scale them, if one of those spines gets me in the finger, it hurts like the dickens. I'm also going to remove the pectoral fin. And I am not a marine biologist. I don't know what this fin is called, but that also has some pretty fierce spines in it. And this is really more for my own personal safety than anything else. So that's that. I'm going to leave the tail on it. So anytime I'm scaling fish, I do it outside. If I did this in the kitchen, my wife would get pissed at me because the scales end up flying all over the place. They sell a specialized tool for doing this, but I've always found just a butter knife will get the job done. And basically you just want to scrape them from the tail towards the head. And we're going to be serving these with the skin on, so you really just want to make sure you're thorough, get all those scales off of there. Nobody wants to eat a fish scale. So now the fun part, now we got to gut them. I'm going to start right at the vent, cut all the way up. I'm going to make sure you get everything out of that body cavity, and we'll give that a good rinse too. And that scup is ready to fry. So now we want to dry these off really well with paper towels. sure we dry out the body cavity as well. We don't want any water in there when these things hit the frying pan. Now if it was just me eating these I'd leave the head on. There's actually some good little bits of meat in there but I think a couple of our diners today are let's say a little bit squeamish and they might not want their food looking back at them so I am going to cut the heads off. All right, next step, we're going to score both sides of the fish. We don't want to cut all the way down. We just want to go down about a quarter of an inch or so. And this is going to let the flavors really get into the meat. Do a nice crosshatch pattern on that. So now we want to give these a good dose of salt. And this is pretty important to salt the fish. We're going to be rolling these around in flour. And this salt is going to pull moisture out of the fish. And when that moisture mixes with the flour, it's going to turn into a glue. And that's going to make our outer layer of flour stick to the fish much better. I want to do that on both sides. So we have some all-purpose flour. Can add a little bit of cornmeal to that, not a lot. I'll just give it a little nice texture. So now we're gonna season our flour. We get some garlic powder. Put some ground ginger in there. Just a little bit of cayenne. You gotta go easy with this stuff, it's hot. And some white pepper. I'm just gonna mix this together with a fork. Now we're going to dredge each side of our scup into the flour. I like to bend them a little bit like that and get it all in the nooks and crannies. That scup is ready to fry. I like to take a little extra flour, dump that over the top. Now this is another important step. We're gonna pop these in the refrigerator. We want these to chill for at least, let's say a half an hour. That way that breading's really gonna to stick to the fish and it's gonna make for a much better coating. That salt is gonna draw out the moisture from the fish and make the flour stick better to it. 
All right, while our fish is resting in the fridge, we're gonna head out to the garden, get some accoutrements for our general size fish. You guys wanna go outside? Let's go get that rabbit. Get that rabbit. Everybody knows you gotta have some broccoli with your general size chicken. So this is pretty much the end of my broccoli harvest. Miss that piece. But luckily we are in sugar snap pea season. So we'll do some of those with it as well. Some nice purple peas. And it's weird, everywhere, every year I plant sugar snap peas, but like most of them come out skinny like a Chinese pea pod, which is fine. They taste just as good. So many peas. And that's a pretty good haul. I think that'll be plenty. Back to the kitchen. Now we're gonna get started with our General Tso's sauce. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, there's a ton of sugar in this recipe. It looks like an obscene amount. I've tried making it with less and it's not nearly as good. So we're gonna start out with one cup, yes, you heard that right, one cup of white sugar. To that, we are gonna add a quarter cup of water. Turn on the heat. And we're gonna simmer this for about 15 minutes until you can really start to smell like a caramel smell and it'll just start to darken up slightly. So essentially what we're making here is a caramel. And you gotta keep an eye in on this and keep it moving as it's cooking. It is prone to burning to the pan. The other thing this recipe has is a lot of ginger. We're looking for about a quarter cup of ground ginger. We're gonna wanna slice this nice and thin. So we're looking for about three tablespoons. That's a little less than a quarter cup. Freeze the rest of this ginger. It freezes really well. Now this recipe calls for three cloves of garlic. These cloves are very large, so I'm just gonna use two of them. So again, we're gonna mince that up. So a lot of garlic, a lot of ginger. That's the key to making a good general sow sauce. garlic right in with our ginger. Now we're going to take three teaspoons of cornstarch. We're going to add a quarter cup of warm water to the cornstarch. Give that a stir until the cornstarch is dissolved. Next up, a quarter cup of soy sauce. Next, we have two tablespoons of sesame oil. And last but not least, we have one to two tablespoons of chili crunch. This is really good stuff. It's really spicy. I'm not sure how much the people that are gonna be eating this like spicy stuff, so I'm gonna go about one and a half tablespoons on that. That also gives it that nice bright red color. Now with sugar, we really wanna keep this moving. You can see it is bubbling up nicely. It's getting thicker. The color is just starting to change. I'm gonna let this go for about four or five more minutes. And whatever you do, and I did this the first time I ever made it. Do not lick the spatula. This stuff is like molten lava. I'm gonna want a quarter cup rice wine vinegar. And I like to add a little bit of this stuff too. This is my secret weapon. This is MSG. A lot of people are afraid of it. Studies have found that it has absolutely no side effects. And a little bit of this stuff goes a long ways. I'm gonna do maybe a quarter teaspoon in there. You can find it in pretty much every supermarket. If you look where the salt is, you'll see a bottle of stuff called Accent. And Accent is kind of a code name for MSG. But highly recommend it. I put this stuff in chowder. I put it in soups, um, salad dressings. It's pretty much used in a lot of commercial foods that people don't realize it is. And like I said, there's been plenty of studies done that show 
there's absolutely no bad effects caused by MSG. It's perfectly safe to eat. All right, so you can see our sugar is starting to crystallize on the side of the pan. It's changing color. It's getting that kind of amber color to it. Um, it has a real strong smell of caramel. This is ready to go. We're gonna add our other sauce ingredients and it's gonna go crazy. And you wanna stir it quick because that sugar is gonna wanna lump up. Like a volcano. I'm gonna reduce the heat to low. We're also gonna add in our garlic and ginger. And we're just gonna cook this for about two or three minutes until everything comes together. Stirring it constantly. And last but not least, some whole dried chilies in there. It's gonna give it a little extra heat and make it look pretty. Now we're just gonna cook this on low heat, stirring it constantly. Just wanna render out some of that flavor from the ginger and the garlic. We'll probably let it go for two or three minutes. And the sauce will be done. Relax. Hey, we got an eater. Woohoo! Here. <laughs> got a scuff eater. Tommy! Tommy? No biting. All right, we're gonna eat something green, so we're gonna steam up our veggies. I'm gonna steam our broccoli for about three to four minutes, and those peas are only gonna take a minute or two to cook. All right, so we're almost ready to fry up some scup. I'm using an electric frying pan. I think this is by far the best way to fry any kind of fish. Um, the nice thing about it is it has a thermostat on it, which holds the oil at a pre precise temperature. So we're cooking at this at 350 degrees. I'll put the fish in there, the oil temperature will drop down. This will automatically adjust it and bring that back up to 100, 350 degrees. And these frying pans are relatively cheap. This model is made by Presto. I think these sell for about $50. I'm gonna let these go for about three minutes per side. These fish are pretty small. They're gonna cook fairly quick. All right, veggies are steamed. Maybe there's a shot of cold water to stop the cooking. These guys have been rocking for about three minutes. We're gonna flip them over. Best way to do this is with two fish spatulas. This allows us to kind of drain some of the oil off the bottom side. Where we flip them. Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to check the temperature. I don't want to serve anybody raw fish. So this is up over 160 degrees. That's definitely cooked. And anytime I'm frying fish, I always put it on a metal wire drying rack. I don't put them on top of paper towels. That can make them kind of soggy. And that allows any excess oil to drip out of them. All right, our scup are fried up nice and crispy. Now we are going to artistically arrange them on a platter. Don't forget about the broccoli. Now for the best part, heaping spoonfuls of General Sao sauce. And last but not least, sesame seeds. There you have it, General Sao's Cup. All right, boys, don't be shy. Right in. Everybody gets a scup. You get a scup. You get a scup. I get a scup.
cup up. Yeah, it's sauce is it's a great recipe. Cheers, guys. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for eating my scup. Give me an excuse to go fishing. <laughs>